Good afternoon and welcome to the February 13th, 2023 Major Mondays webinar, uh, Combating Hemp One Demand's Defense and Resolution Strategies. There I am, hello everyone. Uh, hope everyone enjoyed the Super, the Super Bowl and we're all recovering today. Uh, we got a, quite a few slides to get through, but I want this to be more practical than the prior Hemp One trainings we've given. So I'm gonna try and go through the background materials relatively quickly, and then we'll get to the practical advice and questions at the end. So what is the health insurance matching program? So this is how a health insurer, not a no-fault carrier, uh, gets reimbursed for workers' comp treatment that they believe uh, the workers' comp carrier should have paid. Uh, there are separate processes in place for no-fault. It comes from uh, workers' comp law sections 13A, 13D, and 13H. That's all under section 13, that's not 13-A. Um, and the HIMP rules and regulations, the actual regulation for that is 12 NYCRR 325-5 and 325-6. So why is it called the matching program? A question I get quite frequently. So uh, the health insurer's claim has to match a claim that the board has. So they submit a reimbursement request uh, to the board and the board notifies them of a full, partial, or no match. Now, these reimbursement requests are actually somewhat automatic and quite informal. Uh, it's not like they're, they're putting together a demand and sending it to the board and the board is responding. It seems to be data that is submitted periodically and automatically by these healthcare subrogation companies. Uh, so they'll get them once, twice, three times a month, but uh, it seems to be done in bulk primarily. Uh, the hemp one form can only be served on a carrier if the board provides a full match. Uh, and a hemp on demand usually has three important dates on it. If you look at part one of the form, date reimbursement request filed, that means the date the data was sent to the board asking for a match, the match date, which is a couple boxes over from that on the right, and the date of service, which is the operative date for our objections. So how the hemp one demand is made. So the health insurer is required to use the hemp one form with part one completed. This is important for what we're gonna talk about later. Um, Section 325-6.3C of the hemp regulations specifies all of the information that should be included. Um, spoiler alert, they are supposed to include the amounts actually billed by the providers and very few of them actually do. Uh, so that is a totally legit request for further information that you can make in investigating a hemp. Uh, the hemp form itself includes a certification that the notice was mailed to the carrier and allegedly proof of service is attached. Very few of them actually do that. Uh, and the carrier has 90 days to respond. So how can you see a hemp one coming? Well, if you see a health insurer and a hemp agent, and um, there's a slide in here about all of the common uh, parties of interest that we see for hemp purposes that I'll show you guys in a sec. But if you see a health insurer or hemp agent as a party of interest in e-case, that means that a reimbursement request has been submitted to the board and the board has provided them with a full or partial match. They will not have e-case access unless they get a full match, but if they did get a full match, they'll be able to access the board file. So, you know, don't let them say like, oh, I was unaware that this CA.1 was resolved in your favor. I mean, they should have been aware. Um, so you'll see, I, this is from old e-case, but you know, the, under the new e-case setup, the codes are the same and the setup's the same. You can see, uh, I took a little screenshot here. Uh, the WHO code of H9 will usually be the health insurer. So you can see WellPoint Inc here. Um, and VH will usually be the hemp agent. And if you're asking what a hemp agent is, think of it as like a TPA for the health insurer, basically the company they retain to go out and chase after the reimbursement for them. So here's some common hemp on parties. We'll blow through this very quickly, but if you see these guys as parties of interest in e-case, that should be setting off a few alarm bells. So Anthem, United Healthcare, WellPoint, Aetna, uh, WellPoint is Anthem and vice versa. Um, Excellus, CDC, WTC Health Fund, that's World Trade Center, uh, Group Health Incorporated, or GHI, Health Insurance Plan of Greater New York, or HIP, uh, Affinity Health Plan, and Fidelis Care. These are ones we see quite frequently. And then, you know, sort of the big guns in terms of the healthcare subrogation uh, hemp agent market, HCSG, Healthcare Subrogation Group, Rawlings Company, Meridian Resource Company, HMS Workers Comp, and Gainwell Technologies. All right, issues giving rise to hemp exposure. So why might a health insurer end up paying for treatment that the comp carrier should have paid for? Well, by far uh, the most common example is ER treatment on the date of loss or early in the case. This is before anyone knows it's a comp claim and this is just your average ER doctor 
you know, submitting bills to a health insurer because that's what they do. And they're not familiar with the board process. So uh, that's a very common scenario is initial ER services. Denied claims, obviously, if so somebody's paying for the medical treatment while we're filing CA.1s and litigating compensability. Uh, disputed or consequential injury sites for the same reason, the claimant's gonna continue to treat while causal relationship is being litigated. MG2 or C4 off denials, you know, um, off the doctor may go ahead with the surgery regardless, and I can tell you the claimant's not paying for it. Um, surgeries or diagnostic studies where we pay the provider, but not necessarily the facility. So uh, an example of this is say you have, you know, MRI group as the company where the claimant goes and gets an MRI, and the radiologist is Dr. Smith. A lot of times, Dr. Smith will submit his bill to the workers' comp board for reimbursement, and we'll pay Dr. Smith, but MRI group actually never gets paid. Uh, the health insurer gets that bill, and then all of a sudden, you know, we see a facility bill for an MRI that we paid previously. So no prior payment argument in that instance. Um, CA.1 is resolved in our favor. Uh, a big cautionary note here, be wary of accepting injury sites in a section 32. I want you guys to get an idea of your potential hemp exposure first. Say, you know, it's a right knee injury and you're litigating consequential right ankle or vice versa. Um, before you go ahead and accept the right ankle or right knee, whatever the consequential injury site is, in a section 32 just to get it done, um, I would definitely recommend checking out how much treatment there has been to those injury sites first, because you may be just accepting it to put through the 32, and then next thing you know, there's a $150,000 amputation bill that comes through the door. Uh, and by accepting it, per the 32, you've just given them another year to submit the hemp demand because they do have a year from the latest of ANCR or acceptance to serve it. So just keep that in mind. Um, the operative timing uh, for the submission of a hemp demand, they have to get a match from the board within three years of the date of payment for services. And then they have to serve, they can only serve once they get a full match. Uh, and then there's a couple of dates that are operative thereafter. A year from the date of payment for services, a year from the match from the board, or as I just mentioned, a year from ANCR or acceptance. There's another one that's a year from the effective date of the HIMP rules or regulations, but that was June 1st, 2016. So practically it doesn't apply anymore. Uh, but ask yourself the following question to see HIMP exposure coming. Uh, if we're not responsible and section 13F says the claimant isn't, then how is this doctor getting paid? Investigating the treatment, I do recommend doing this in high value HIMPs, unless you're pretty sure it's gonna knock down your objection. So we are authorized to get the records under the HIMP rules and regs. They have to send it to us within 14 days, or they could get a Section 13D penalty, which could include removal from the list of authorized providers. You can issue subpoenas under uh, Workers' Comp Law Section 119 to compel production if they don't respond. Uh, ask yourself how much clarity would the records provide? Could they defeat our objection? For instance, if we're making sort of a spurious argument about causal relationships saying, you know, these records were never filed with the board and the doctor normally files their records, so hence it's not causally related. And then all of a sudden we get the records from the doctor and it says, oh yeah, this is definitely causally related. Uh, that's problematic. So uh, the other thing is the cost benefit analysis, compo cost -benefit analysis component. Uh, you know, how much are you gonna pay an attorney to subpoena records, you know, on a $300 hip? Um, so at a certain point, practical considerations enter into the equation. Um, the, no, this is an important note here. The health insurer under the hemp rules and regs cannot unreasonably refuse to grant an extension for you to investigate, but you cannot use a records request solely to delay reimbursement or arbitration. So you can't respond to a hemp by saying, hey, I, you didn't send me the records, therefore I'm objecting. Technically, they only have to send you what's in 325-6.3c, and a lot of them do it on their own payment ledgers. They don't bother to send you the records or the HICFAs or any of that stuff. Um, so note that not having the records is not a valid objection. Not having any information is a valid objection. Um, but as long as they give you what 6.3C requires, they're in the clear and every arbitrator has agreed with that position over time. Um, but they can't unreasonably refuse to give you an extension to investigate. So feel free to ask for that if you're coming up on the 90 days. That's a nice little tool in your arsenal. Speaking of 90 days, objecting to the hemp. So you must serve your objection within 90 days of the hemp on the date of service. Um, the parties can extend that, day, that deadline in writing. You have to object on part two of the hemp form, but still support your objection with documents or evidence. Um, 
when I say part two of the hemp form, they fill out part one, and then there's a part two that says carrier response. You have to serve that back with your objection. And it has to have your signature on it and you check off all the applicable objections. Proof of service is required. They never hold you to it, but it's best practices. Specific objections are listed uh, and we'll go over them in a second. And I always recommend a full objection brief with exhibits and high exposure hemp. Here are your specific objections and anyone who's been practicing in New York for a while uh, is gonna recognize these as familiar objections to compensability in general. No ANCR, untimely service of the hemp demand, no causal relationship, uh, authorization re requested and denied and the treatment was non-emergent, fee in excess of the fee schedule, bill should have been prorated, uh, carrier can't determine responsibility from documents served, prior payment to provider, you need proof of this, uh, treatment after meds closed via 32, a section 29 credit or offset, and a big one here, treatment outside of MTGs. Um, just a note about the fee schedule. Yes, you need to support it with a calculation. There are vendors that do this. It'll typically run you about $150 an hour. So depending on, complex, uh, on complexity, it might be anywhere from $300 to $900 to get it done. The benefit to doing that is the vendor can testify as to the amounts of arbitration if necessary. You don't want your med pay department being dragged in to testify. So in a high value hemp, I would recommend having a vendor do it. And you do need to support it if the fee schedule objection is the only one you're raising, but it does apply in every case. All right, catch all and prohibited objection. So under other on the hemp form, number 12, you can interpose any objection that demonstrates the request for reimbursement should not be made. A hemp is not eligible for reimbursement or arbitration if there's no ANCR or acceptance. This is important. We're gonna come back to that in a minute. You can't object based on the following. No prior authorization under workers' comp law 13A5. Failure of a provider to file required notices. Those are your C4.0, C4.2s, med narrows, all of that stuff. Treatment excessive or too frequent, unless it's inconsistent with the guidelines. Hospital hospitalization, excessive or unnecessary, unless inconsistent with the guidelines. A word about that no prior authorization. 13A5 applies to special services costing over $1,000. If it's one of those particular surgeries or procedures, that expressly requires prior authorization on the C4 auth form, that is still treatment inconsistent with the medical treatment guidelines. So keep that in mind. It's not failure to file a C4 auth uh, or the PAR equivalent of a C4 auth uh, is an invalid objection. It's only if you're objecting based on special services in excess of $1,000 uh, requiring prior authorization. I'll go through arbitration very quickly because uh, it seldom ever gets this far. Every one of them happens in front of the AAA. Yeah, uh, you must request an oral hearing. This is uh, very recommended. Uh, in writing, within 14 days of the arbor request, the cost is $475 payable simultaneously. Um, you have a 14-day period to object based on improper untimely service after the AAA issues an acknowledgement. Either party can be represented by counsel and present witnesses. Uh, any new objections or evidence must be served within 14 days of acknowledgement for a desk hearing, or at least 14 days before an oral hearing, and must include an affidavit as to service on the other party and why it was not produced previously and proof of service. Uh, the decision comes out in writing within 30 days of completion of the hearing. The award is payable within 30 days. Uh, request for reconsideration must be made within 15 days. These are seldom ever granted and any appeals are gonna be subject to CPLR Article 75. All right, here's what we're here for, the practical advice component. So, number one, and I can't stress this one enough, watch out for informal demands, phishing expeditions, and scare tactics. If you get a letter saying, we have determined that this claim is subject to reimbursement, you need to pay us X, here's our payment ledger. By the way, fill out this form telling us whether or not this is a comp claim. Don't send them a check. That should be setting off massive red flags. They would have all of that information if they had actually gotten a match from the board. So watch out and then they'll send you notices that say, you know, it's, it's been 30 days, you have to issue payment. It's been 60, you have to issue payment. Well, unless they actually hit you with a HIMP compliant form, there's no timeline running. So don't fall for that nonsense and just send checks on informal demands, please. Um, Make, make sure your fee calculation is defensible if necessary. We talked about having a vendor do it. Uh, remember that the filing of an MG2 is a doctor's admission that treatment is not consistent with the MTGs. So don't let the health insurers second guess that. 
the doctor is requesting a variance, it's because the doctor has deemed a variance necessary. That variance is never granted. Don't let the health insurer tell you, uh, well, no, turns out it actually is consistent with the guidelines. Not, no, it's not. I mean, that, that's on the provider to prove. So um, you can object based on failure to file a C4 off if the, basement is, if the basis is treatment, requires authorization under the MTGs. We just talked about that. Um, you can use the PAR system to argue the MTGs or denied treatment. Uh, so you might see some of these like MGL1s request for, uh, you know, carrier uh, affirmance basically that the treatment is legit. It's not even authorization or variance request. It's literally just saying, can you please confirm this complies with the guidelines? Well, I mean, if you say no, you know, the hemp rules and regs haven't really caught up with PAR yet. So, you know, let them tell you that's not tantamount to a denial, right? Uh, remember the MTGs for treatment after 5222. We have a whole bunch of injury sites now. Uh, general issues like basis for surgery, repeat diagnostic studies, you know, failure of conservative care, um, you know, uh, documented uh, functional gains and all that other stuff that we need for baseline compensability of surgery, or, you know, a change in status warranting a repeat diagnostic study. All of that stuff now applies to almost everything. Uh, and then that's on top of the specific treatment being regulated for all of those injury sites. So uh, data service after 5222, keep in mind the MTGs, the new ones. All right, if you're not sure whether an objection applies, raise it anyway. There is no harm to checking off the box and not standing by that argument at arbitration or withdrawing it later. Nobody's gonna hold you to it. Just check off the box, just be safe. Uh, I mean, if you really want to be belligerent about it, just check off all the boxes and let them tell you it doesn't apply. But checking off only causal relationship in a case that hasn't been accepted or established is problematic. You should be checking off both because ANCR includes causal relationship. The fee schedule applies in literally every one of these. So if you're not checking off number five every time, that's also a problem. Uh, along those same lines, be wary of serving an incomplete objection. If you serve one and then you realize, oh shoot, I could have made this other argument, the moment the health insurer requests arbitration in response to your objection, you have now lost the right to raise those additional arguments. So don't serve an object, yes, you serve something within the first 90 days, right, on part two of the HIMP form. But if you're still investigating if additional objections apply, don't serve like a preemptive one because your worst case scenario is they request arbitration a day later and you're stuck with that one objection you raised. Uh, if nothing else, attach a fee schedule analysis and check off any potentially applicable objections. We just talked about that. Ask for an extension if you need it, but do something within the first 90 days or almost every argument is waived. If you're past the 90 days, here are some strategies. Try getting an, an extension on the basis of investigation into meds. I can't, again, they can't unreasonably refuse authorization of that. Object anyway, in case the arbitrator, you know, is having a good day and decides to accept the arguments. Try to secure a fee schedule settlement. They'll bite on this nine times out of 10 instead of fighting you at arbitration. Just say, hey, in lieu of us objecting, uh, we calculate the fee schedule to be X. What's kind of nuanced about this is um, technically, if you don't raise the fee schedule argument, it's waived, but they'll usually still bite on it. Um, and then you can raise never wa waived defenses. And you'll see I put fee schedule in here and I'll explain that in a sec. So ineligible for arbitration, that's a defense that can't be waived if you fail to object, right? Because failing to object is what gets it to arbitration in the first place. So a prior hemp demand for the same treatment, if they never requested arbitration within 90 days of your prior objection, they've waived the right to arbitrate those expenses. Uh, no ANCR or acceptance means it's ineligible for arbitration. No full match from the board means it's ineligible for arbitration. Defective form or service, um, there's a line of cases out there in the county courts that say that if you've designated an address for service of HIMPS and then they send it to your general claims mailbox, that you can argue, well, I never actually got proper service of this, so how was I on notice of the HIMP? Arbitration is improper. You, I have seen some carriers get away with that argument. Note that it does require designating an address in advance. We're gonna talk about that in a sec. And fee schedule. So I just said that that's one that can be waived, but uh, both the HIMP rules and regs and section 13 expressly limit a carrier's liability for payment to the fee schedule. So let an arbitrator tell you it doesn't apply. I mean, there's nothing in the HIMP rules and regs that 
specifically says it's waived, other than, you know, if you don't raise one of these objections, they're deemed waived if you don't do it within 90 days. So argue that the worst case scenario, the ARB award should be the fee schedule. All right, practical advice for combating HIMP one demands part three. My five golden rules, if you take away nothing else, take these away. Determine uh, whether it's an actual HIMP or a fishing expedition. Determine whether there's ANCR acceptance for the treatment in the HIMP. If not, that's an immediate objection. Determine any other permissible objections like we talked about a component of ANCR is CR itself. So if, if you're raising ANCR and not causal relationship, you're doing yourself a disservice. Fee schedule applies across the board. Check for the MTGs. Check if it comes after a 32. Check if there's a section 29 credit, which believe it or not, I have seen apply. Uh, under no circumstances pay anything over the fee schedule. Always run that analysis either in-house or have a vendor do it. And at bare minimum, object in writing on part two of the HIMP form with all potentially applicable objections within 90 days. Do something within 90 days and ideally do, you know, go overboard instead of underboard on these. Uh, because once you get past that 90 day mark, the amount of, you know, wizardry you're gonna be able to pull off to get out of it is, is quite slim. All right, here's some creative and preemptive defense measures that were sort of in uncharted territory here, but I recommend giving some consideration here. Like I said, set an address for service of HIMPs, otherwise you're just gonna use the one you have in the board file and have them stipulate to it. So the next time you get a HIMP from you know, HCSG, you reach out to HCSG and say, hey, attached is the stipulation, this is our address for service. We'll stop raising uh, defective service arguments if you send all HIMPs here. And then they sign off on it. Well, in the future, if you miss one and it went to your general claims mailbox, like I said, I've seen people get away with that in civil court actually having an arbitration award vacated. Uh, if you keep getting HIMPs over and over with the same providers uh, from the same health insurer, consider sending the health insurer a letter advising them that you're not gonna pay for any more HIMPs uh, and arguing that continued HIMPs is intentional circumvention of the board process. You know, this is creating an objection where there isn't one. You're saying there's a process in place, the provider's clearly aware of it because we objected previously, you're clearly aware of it, why are they not billing us directly? Uh, consider placing providers on notice if they keep billing the health insurer and seeking, this is similar to what we just talked about, and seeking a board ruling with a CA.1A or RFA2, including a CA.1A. So this is actually kind of um, clever. If you keep seeing the same provider pop up in the board file, but you're getting the bills from the HIMP process and not from the provider directly, File an RFA too. Ask for an admin decision directing them to adhere to the board process. You know, or even if it goes to a hearing, you know, good luck finding a law judge that's going to say no. I'm not going to direct the provider to follow the law. Uh, and again, you're creating objections where there aren't one, where there isn't one. Otherwise, um, address potential hymns in a section 32. In a denied case, say the claimant is withdrawing the claim. You can't make legal findings for the board. You can't say this claim is deemed denied. We all know they'll reject that language in a 32, but have the claimant withdraw it because then you're closing out any compensability argument. Don't accept random injury sites if there's hemp exposure. Or to do you one better, you know, the parties agree that the medical exposure contemplated herein shall be the extent of the carrier's liability, uh, notwithstanding any process pursuant to the health insurance matching program or some nonsense like that. Just put in language that the board approves that says this is it for your medical liability. And then guess what you have? A board decision saying you're not on the hook. You know, again, let them tell you it doesn't apply, right? Uh, if the hemp comes in while compensability is being litigated or it's on appeal, object immediately. This is a strategic decision because they have 90 days to request arbitration from the date you object. And your nightmare scenario is like you wait 90 days before you object. And then a day later, um, you know, the board panel decision comes back upholding establishment of the case. Well, while that was on appeal, you had a valid, valid argument as to lack of ANCR or acceptance. Now you don't anymore. So start the 90 day clock on them, uh, start the 90 day clock running on them to request arbitration before that adverse board ruling. Because if they fail to request arbitration within 90 days, they've waived the right to arbitrate those expenses like we talked about. Um, and this is some real next level stuff here. Consider moving for stay of arbitration when warranted in high exposure HIMSS. These are the cases we talked about where we can argue it's not even eligible for arbitration. 
a prior demand with no arb request, like they didn't request arbitration within 90 days for the same expenses, no ANCR or acceptance, no evidence of a full match, et cetera, or simultaneously, this should be an end or, uh, respond to the uh, acknowledgement from the AAA saying we're moving for dismissal of this arbitration. It's ineligible for arbitration pursuant to this regulation. Move for a stay in civil court to cover your butt on that side, and then simultaneously move for dismissal of the arbitration claim before it ever gets to a hearing. All right, and the takeaway slide before we get to questions. Never just pay the HIMP. It's a very official looking form. They'll send you threatening letters every 30 days. You have defenses. Never just cut them a check for the full amount. Uh, your worst case scenario is the fee schedule. Always keep that in mind. Make sure your, the HIMP one is compliant and the demand is legitimate. It's not just a fishing expedition. Uh, run through objections on part two of the HIMP form one by one. Remember, more is better than less. So if you're not sure if it applies, check it off anyway. Um, ask would I have been able to object to this bill if it were properly submitted during the workers' comp claim? If the answer to that is no, for instance, it exceeds the guidelines without a variance, the bill is wildly untimely, uh, it's an out-of-network provider, uh, you know, I would have filed the CA.4 for valuation on this. If the answer to that question is no, chances are there's an applicable hemp objection to it. Uh, don't be afraid to arbitrate and push for an oral hearing. You'd be surprised how much that $475 fee, how far that actually goes. When they see you're willing to fight, you know, most of the time they just want some money. So the moment you demonstrate a backbone, they'll be willing to work with you on a settlement. Um, look to resolve bulk HIMP on submissions in a global settlement, but don't pay on HIMPs that are truly illegitimate or not payable, like ones that are blatantly untimely. But if you're getting like dozens of these from the same HIMP agent, like every two weeks, I mean, filing objections on all of them just isn't feasible. Run the fee schedule, assess them for um, any other applicable objections, reduce the fee schedule offer accordingly. Like if there's an iffy MTG's argument, offer them 50% of the fee schedule and bulk them all together. Save yourself some time, save yourself some money. They, again, they just wanna get paid. So there's a 99% chance they bite on it. Uh, and always, always, always object to a very large hemp I'm talking like $50,000 or more. Some of these get up into $300,000 or more uh, protectively, even when you're discussing settlement. Because your worst case scenario is the settlement falls through and you don't have a timely objection on the books. Plus, serving a valid objection really does give you some leverage in settlement negotiations. All right, that was a lot of material. I thank everyone for hanging in there. Let's see if we got any questions on this process. Oh, I was having uh, trouble at this audio trouble at the start. Did you say hemp has to be filed within three years of payment and within one year of full match with the workers' comp board? So there's actually two different timelines to worry about here. The date of payment for services, not the date of service. So, you know, if the person treats in March and they pay in April, the date of payment for service, they have three years from that date to get a match from the board. The moment they have a match from the board, they're permitted, provided it's a full match, to serve a HIMP demand. At that point, there's four different applicable deadlines. One year from the date of payment for service, one year from the match date, uh, one year from ANCR acceptance. Again, this is why I wouldn't accept random injury sites into Section 32. You're extending their leash quite a bit. And one year from the effective date of the HIMP rules and regs, which again is June 1st, 2016. So it practically doesn't apply anymore. So they have to get a match within three years of the data payment for services. And then after that, they have to actually serve you with the HIMP one form within one year of those four different dates that I just listed. So, um, you know, just let me know if that doesn't make sense. And obviously I'm always happy to talk it out over the phone or shoot me an email, see major at LOAS LLC. Um, I think that's the only question I have. So hopefully uh, we address that adequately. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining, and uh, as usual, I hope to see you next month. Hope this was helpful.